and welcome to our second segment about the New Hampshire Driving Toward Zero project. My name is Kimberly Haas. Today we're talking about seatbelt safety and motorcycle safety. I am joined by Howard Hedegaard, Steve Groton, and Bob Letourneau. Maybe I'll have each of you introduce yourselves to the audience at home. I'm Howard Hedegaard, the Highway Safety Specialist at the Injury Prevention Center at Dartmouth and I am involved in educational programs throughout the state with a primary emphasis on seatbelt use, teen driving, distracted driving. Great. And I'm, the, uh, I'm Steve Gratton and I'm the coordinator for New Hampshire and the Safe Teen Driver Program. And it's funded by the Allstate Foundation and sponsored by uh, New Hampshire Pediatric Society. And Bob? Good afternoon. Good morning, and I am Bob Letourneau, representing the Motorcycle Rider Training Program from the state of New Hampshire. Now, each of you have been heavily involved for years with some of these issues. Maybe we could start by talking a little bit about seatbelt safety first and why it's so important that everybody buckles up. It's absolutely important that everybody buckle up every trip, every time, short trips to the store, the long open road trips, when the traffic is light, when the roads are dry, people so often will buckle up in situational situations. We know the data shows it, the crash data shows it, the, the, the educational studies assessment show that seat belts do reduce injuries, do save lives. Seat belts are by far the most important safety device in our motor vehicles and all the other safety devices as Steve can expand on just become non-functional, non-valuable if the seat belt isn't in use. Now maybe you could talk a little bit about well, that, Steve. Well, so much about car design is built around the seat belt uh, being worn and the safety of a car is dependent upon uh, the, the car companies assume that the uh, people inside the car are belted. So the airbag systems, the steel structure, actually the more modern the car, the more important the seat belt becomes now. And it's a, a We've had them around forever, but very few people understand how they truly work. And that is so important because, like you said, yeah. everything is based upon wearing a seatbelt. Now, Bob, with motorcycles, it's a little bit different. Obviously, a motorcycle doesn't have a seatbelt. What's the number one most important thing that a person can do to be safe on a motorcycle? Well, in my personal opinion, the, most, the number one most important thing that motorcycles can do is get properly trained. Uh, we know and we have the data to show that those who take motorcycle training are more likely to stay alive and, and not get into crashes. Uh, the data that we have shows that uh, over the, the 15, 23 year period that we've had with motorcycle training here in New Hampshire, we've trained over 44,000 riders. Uh, of those 44,000 riders, uh, something in the order of 15 or 16 have been involved in fatals over a 23 year period. That means that 99.7% uh, of those who did not get training uh, represent the, the, the balance of those who have been uh, killed on motorcycles doing accidents here in New Hampshire. And it's a huge number. Now, how does motorcycle training work? It's a little bit different than driver's ed for cars. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's not a simple program. It's a, uh, we, we, we don't just pass it. You have to take it, you have to, you have to qualify, and if you don't, you don't get your motorcycle license. It's that simple. Uh, the, and I think that's a good reason why our safety record is so high. It's a three-day course for a basic rider course and involves uh, 20 hours of training. Uh, some of it is classroom and the rest of it is on the range. It is approximately, I would say, probably 12 hours at least on the range itself and the rest is classroom training. Now, Bob brought up a few statistics about the number of highway fatalities. Is, are there correlating statistics for seatbelt use? Uh, there absolutely are. For example, last year in the state of New Hampshire, those people who died in contained motor vehicles, meaning not the pedestrians, the bicyclists, and the motorcyclists, but the people who are in vehicles that by design have seat belts, 81% of the people, four out of five of the people who died last year in crashes in New Hampshire were not wearing their seat belts. We know that 
most of the people would still be here with us today, would still be with their family celebrating the upcoming holidays, um, if indeed they only had their seatbelts on. The simple device, that quick little buckle, would have made all the difference in the world. And so, in not all crashes, but in the majority of them. What ends up happening frequently is the parent, the wife, the husband always has to ask that what if question. What if that person had had their belt on? And um, it makes an enormous difference. I mean, there's statistics that show that uh, belts are the number one safety component of an automobile. And it does reduce the injury and the fatalities because there's a tremendous number of injuries that uh, go on that uh, don't get the headlines like the fatalities do. Mm -hmm. So if we can prevent some of those traumatic brain injuries, for example, I mean, there's an excess of over 300 traumatic brain injuries from non-belted teens in this state per year. Uh, that's a scary figure. That's a very uh, life-changing injury. And if we can reduce those um, and just stop so many people asking, what if? What if my son, my daughter, my husband had had the belt on? Would the outcome have been different? And uh, so we are passionate about seat belts. Uh, and as, as Bob mentioned with the training program for the motorcyclists, Steve and I, for the past four years, have been taking a program into the high school to community groups. For example, this coming Monday, we'll be with an explorer group over in Rochester, small group, 10, 12 students. We have also gone in and, and done high school assemblies, six, seven, eight hundred, twelve hundred students. Um, and it's called Room to Live. And the whole design of the program is to show structurally how automobiles, uh, as Steve mentioned, mm -hmm. the more modern the automobile, the safer by design it is assuming that we have our seatbelts on. And we do present uh, a full program showing exactly how everything works within an automobile in a crash situation, and therefore why the seatbelt actually will and, and, and can, for the most part, save lives and reduce injuries. Now, what is the Room to Live program? What are the parts of it? What do you talk about with the teenagers when you get into the high school? The Room, the room to Live program is based on a Fox News report. I hope I can say that on your station. <laughs> but, of course. And it was uh, um, a program that uh, showed that um, a reporter went into, um, followed, all, tracked all the crashes in their vicinity and found that uh, all the time there was room to live if the people had stayed in the car. Being ejected uh, has a, a very bad uh, consequence uh, most of the time. And so if they could get, keep people in the car, um, in the, let the car do its job of protecting you, they were much better off. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a program that raises awareness uh, combined with the fact that we tell them exactly you know, what happens in a crash, you know, that, that how the seatbelt works and that uh, what it's doing to manage the energy and how cars deliberately will crush in order to protect you, but you've got to stay in that seat. Um, that window in front of you is not there to hold you in the car. Um, and it's been presented, uh, and we've done, I think last year we did 32 high schools uh, to various sizes. And uh, uh, we have a very intelligent group of teenagers that want to do better. Um, a lot of research has been done uh, now on the influence of parents on whether their children wear seatbelts, and they are the most determining factor and the highest influence uh, on whether their children wear seatbelts. So, um, you know, if the parents uh, set a good example, uh, we like to say that parents get the driver they are. So if you're eating and texting and following too close and speeding, why do you think your child's going to grow up to be uh, the safest driver in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. We focus primarily on teens because studies do show that overall teens have the lowest seatbelt usage rate and male teens in particular. And Steve has a PowerPoint piece that he walks through showing the structural design of the vehicle, all of the safety design features that are built in. I sh show a couple of video clips of actual crashes that were filmed for ver through various means uh, that shows what happens to the human body when it's thrown around within the vehicle or when it's ejected out. And as Steve mentioned, being ejected, the outcome is typically not good. In 2010, in the crashes that were fatal here in New Hampshire, 26 people were ejected. 25 of those people lost their lives. The 26 is permanently disabled. It is rare that you get up, dust yourself off, and go, wow, that was a cool carnival ride. I'd like to take it again. That's just not the way it plays out. The injury is typically severe and or death will result. 
26 people when you think about that last 2010. And that's really what it's all about is the people, you know, and that's mm -hmm. what the New Hampshire Driving Towards Zero project is all about, is the people um, that have lost their lives on our highways. Kim, nobody ever gets up in the morning and leaves, gets in their car and says, today I'm going to crash. Nobody expects to crash. Um, no one anticipates that it's going to happen to them. They think it happens to other people. Mm -hmm. And crashes are violent. They happen incredibly quickly. And, uh, you know, we've gotten better at building cars. We've gotten better at building roads and uh, guardrails and safety devices. But we as drivers have not improved you know, our attention. In fact, it's hard to find people that are actually focusing on the driving. So it's all connected, uh, being whether it's distracted or wearing the seatbelt. Uh, the highways are more dangerous today. There's more people on them and uh, less people paying attention to what they're doing. Um, we focus on teens because they're the most vulnerable population. They're the highest crash rate. Uh, they make up less than 2% of the entire uh, driving population, yet they're responsible for close to 8% of the crashes. Um, you know, it, they crash more often, especially on a uh, per miles traveled basis. So if we can get some good habits started uh, early on, uh, perhaps this generation of teenagers can influence their parents uh, to drive better. <laughs> I was just going to say that maybe they can be a stronger influence. Now, of course, Howard and Steve mm -hmm. focus on the teenagers. Bob, your program is a little bit different. You focus on a different group with your motorcycle training. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your program. Yes, uh, we have looked at the data and see who is dying on the roads on motorcycles. And strangely enough, it's the 40 to 60 year olds. And we have designed a program around that. Uh, we have developed a new curriculum that we, we released this year in 2012. It's called the Returning Rider Program. And it's focused on people who are coming back into the sport. We know that people uh, have kept their motorcycle license endorsements from their teenage years when they were in high school or in college. Uh, they got married, uh, they, they, they bought a house, they raised children, and now the house is paid off, the kids are out of college, and they've got this expendable income, and they go out and buy their dream motorcycle and um, sadly, uh, they, they die on it because they don't know how to handle it. And I have what I call the three-legged stool. Number one, the rider is older. The rider has uh, less, uh, less vision, less hearing, uh, range of motion is, is str struggled. I, mean, I find myself having a hard time turning my head <laughs> all the way to the left or right. Uh, the, so that's just one leg of the stool, it's the rider itself. The second leg of the stool is the motorcycle. The motorcycles are bigger, they're faster, they're more powerful, they get better brakes, and they have better tires. And you can get out of your skill set in a hurry. And the third leg of the stool is the, the environment out there on the roads itself. Today we have more distracted riders. You heard Howard talking about the distracted drivers. There are people out there talking on cell phones. There are t people texting. There are DVDs. There are GPS units. There's all kinds of things going on inside of automobiles. And a motorcycle is small, and sometimes they don't see you. We train our people to be aware and do defensive driving. And so we're targeting those 40 to 60-year-olds. Interesting enough, Last year, we had 14 fatalities. Nine of the 14 were in that target range. This year, we had 27 fatalities. Over 16 of them have been in that range. So you can see that the majority of people who are dying on the roads are not the teenagers that everybody thinks it is. It's the 40 to 60 year olds. Yeah, when I think of a, a motorcyclist, I, I tend to think of a young gentleman between 20 and 25. Mm -hmm. And you're right, a lot of times when the kids are grown and you have the extra money, you get that dream motorcycle that you've been thinking about all those years and you associate it with that freedom and the freedom to ride and be out in the wind. But it's so important that you're properly trained. Now, once a person is properly trained, what are some of the other things they can do to help them on the roadways? Is it wearing highly visible clothing? Is it 
like you said, driving defensively? What are some of the things that motorcyclists can do? Well, the program itself, the training program itself involves that. It teaches the students to wear protective clothing, to wear their helmets, wear gloves, wear boots that are over your ankles, uh, to wear reflective clothing, and to be aware and do defensive driving. So all that is part of the training. And I think that's one of the reasons why that we see and we see that, that huge difference between the fatalities of those who have been trained and those who have not been trained. Uh, protective clothing and helmets can only go so far. Defensive driving, much further. The training is what works. And so we, we're proud of our training program. Over the, over the 23 years, we have a uh, something like 0.034% of our, our trained riders have been involved in fatal accidents. It's just, uh, it's just amazing to me. Uh, it, I took the training, and I've been riding for over 40 years, and I learned some things from the Experience Rider Program. We have four courses. We have the Basic Rider Course, we have the Intermediate Rider Course, now we have the Returning Rider Course, and we have the Experience Rider Course. So there is a whole variety of, of training available to the motorcyclists in New Hampshire. Now, where can people take that training? How do they sign up for classes? Good question, Kimberly. Uh, we have uh, 11 sites throughout the state. We opened up three new sites uh, in the last year. We opened up Nashua, Londonderry, and a new site in Concord. But in addition to that, we have one in Keene, one in Portsmouth. We have three in Concord. We have one in Laconia. We have one in Whitefield and one in North Haverhill. And, and we have another in Hooksett. So we, we have them around the state, and there's no reason why somebody can't find one close to them. Mm. And we'll make sure that that information is also posted on the website, the New Hampshire Driving Towards Zero website. If you haven't gotten a chance to check it out yet, please do. It's nhdtz.com. Now, you folks do the programs in the high school. Mm -hmm. How can a high school administrator who is watching this show today and is saying, I want that in my school, how can they get you there? Please call. Uh, they, can, they can actually contact uh, Howard at uh, Dartmouth Injury Prevention Center. Uh, I believe we're on your website also uh, for this program. We, uh, we believe in the Driving Towards Zero Death and Injury uh, program. So. Uh, if we're not on your website, we will get our names there so they can contact us. But we would love any school administrator uh, to contact us so we can get seatbelt use up um, and reduce these injuries and deaths. In addition to the Room to Live seatbelt program, Steve and I also, when we go into high schools, do everything we can to bring up the, to create opportunities to discuss the risks involved with distracted driving. Mm -hmm. And as Bob mentioned, uh, the training, the value of the training for the motorcycle drivers. Steve and I both teach uh, through the New Hampshire Traffic Safety Institute a driving attitude course. And over the years, the 12 years that I have taught that I have met many people who have been responsible for causing a crash with a motorcyclist where the motorcyclist either died or was seriously injured. And almost every one of them has said, I didn't see the motorcycle. And various reasons, of course, one of them being distraction itself. So Steve and I, knew, well, last year in New Hampshire, 21% of all crashes, fender benders to fatals, involve some level of distraction. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the seat belt program, we do have a, a very well put together with the, some tools from AT&T program around distraction itself, doing everything we can. It's the behaviors that cause the crashes, the seat belt will reduce the injury or, or maybe save your life in the crash. Um, high school administrator, once they in there, will we'll make something happen that will meet their student body's need. And one real exciting piece, a piece that we really want to encourage, we started, for example, at Spalding High School a, a year or so ago with the Room to Live program. And just two weeks ago, a teen highway safety group that was formed some months back put on a full presentation for 1,200 of their students dealing with brain injuries caused by motor vehicle crashes, dealing with distracted driving, and of course dealing with the importance of the seatbelt. The teens themselves designed this program, presented this program to their peers. We can help any school administrator that would uh, like to see some kind of a peer-to-peer -peer 
educational process start within the school. So, so please reach out to us and we will get our contact information if it's not already there on the Driving Towards Zero website. We'd love to become part of any school's um, solution. I'd like to also add that uh, we have added a new feature to our motorcycle training program. We have this mobile vehicle now called the REV, and it's an acronym for the uh, Transportable High-End Rider Education Vehicle. And inside of the REV, we have this uh, motorcycle smart trainer, which is a computerized motorcycle, which you can ride on and actually function like a regular motorcycle, but you can't get hurt on it. And it, it, and it helps. Kimberly, you, you saw this in action at the 75th anniversary of the police, say police uh, up in Concord. And it's an incredible uh, tool to use. And we will be going out to different dealers throughout the state and, and bringing this vehicle with us for riders to, to experience and to learn that they're not as good as they think they are. And you know, get on this and we, they, it throws out all the different types of uh, scenarios that you would run into on the road. You might be driving down the street and a kid will come out chasing a ball or, or another child will come out on a bicycle or if you're out on the highway a box may fall off a truck mm -hmm. while, you, while you're riding your smart trainer and it, it's a very useful tool to, to let people know that the reaction times are not as fast as they think they are and that they need to get some proper training. Yeah that's a very cool tool. I did <laughs> see that. Um, in Concord not too long ago and for people at home who haven't gotten the chance to check it out you you really really should some of these simulators are very very educational mm -hmm. now are there any other points that you folks would like to bring up before we wrap up the show today I'd like to just you know say again the importance of the parents uh, setting a standard for for their children and start early uh, start uh, when they're you know, I believe that kids start learning how to drive when you turn the child seat to the forward position. And so they're watching you through all those times. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you can tell them what your eyes, when they get older and just before, you know, when they're 13, 14, 15, work with them on where your eyes are looking and all the things that are going on so they don't think the driving is just so simple. Uh, there's a lot going on inside that car. And it, the better example you can be, uh, the safer, uh, teens will have uh, for driving. And, and life is absolutely precious, it just mm -hmm. is. That's the bottom line. Yeah. And we are so fragile, more so than we just even anticipate. And as Steve mentioned earlier, we are convinced that the crash is not gonna happen to us. That some, we know that crashes are happening. We just somehow buy into, no matter how risky our own behaviors may be, that somehow I'm immune from it. Mm. Makes sense. Why would we want to dwell on, focus on? But the reality is the crashes that are happening around the state year after year after year with the injuries and the death are happening to people just like us, doing the same things that so many of us do. We, it's just unwise to assume it will never happen to us. And we just, there's no rewind button. When it happens, the outcome is the outcome. And we need to prevent it from happening. Mm. And just so that we we're perfectly clear, even though I may be focusing on 40 to 60 year olds, we offer the program to all licensed drivers from 16 to whatever. We've had students this year from 16 years of age all the way up to 80 years of age that have taken the course. So it, while we may be focusing on a particular segment and offering a new curriculum, the basic rider program is there for everyone. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, thank you, Kim. all of you. And thank you, everybody at home who is watching today. We certainly appreciate your viewership of all of these programs. Check out the New Hampshire Driving Towards Zero website, nhdtz.com. And let's all be a good example for each other on the roadways. And let's all teach each other, our peers, our family members, about the importance of driving safely. And like how Howard said, life is so precious. Let's work on driving towards zero together. Once again, my name is Kimberly Hawes. Have a great day.